Welcome to Over Your Shoulder. Just like the name, that's what we'll be doing. Today, we're going to be looking over Paul David Hager's shoulder and diving into his front of house rig from the last tour he was on. Paul currently tours with Miley Cyrus and Beck and has toured with the likes of Devo, Goo Goo Dolls, Jonas Brothers, Nick Jonas, Avril Lavigne, Demi Lovato, and many others. In addition to touring, he's also mixed a couple records, which now totals him over 20 gold and platinum records. So let's see what he's got going on. What's up, Paul? Good to see you. I know, same here. Thank you so much for doing this inaugural uh, show of this thing that I'm trying to to do. I'm not sure what it's going to look like, but I'm so glad to have you as the first guest. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Dude, it's going to be fun. I, I mean, the idea, and I, like we had discussed, is kind of like talking about the secret sauce, and we'll, we'll get to that question later. Let's get started. How, how did you get started in the industry in kind of a, a shortish way? Kind of accidentally, because I played in bands in the beginning. So I came up as a guitar player, but I was always the one in my band that dealt with the audio kind of. One of my last bands broke up. I just started mixing bands because we rehearsed at this spot in Rhode Island that um, there was another band that kept tor- like playing out. And every time we went to see them, they sounded horrible. <laughs> they had a sound man. Yeah. And uh, one day they were just like, well, if you think you could do better, go, why don't you do it? <laughs> so they were doing a show at this place called the living room, which is kind of where a lot of people played in Providence. Great little club. I went and did a gig and it sounded good, I guess. I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> if I looked back now, it probably sounded horrible, but <laughs> yeah, their fans liked it. So they were like, oh, okay. You know, I just kept doing gigs from there. At that time, I was still looking to play in a band, but then the BS of playing in a band kind of was wearing on me because you're, you're as a sound person, you're like kind of on your own. Like you're, you can do multiple bands so you don't have to get involved in the politics as much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, until later on in life, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. it's uh, it was just so much easier doing it yourself. And then like there was the same feeling as playing on guitar on stage, almost from mixing a band through a big PA. It brought the same feeling to me, so I kind of liked that and, and went that direction. Okay, so you started started with doing sound for for your band particularly. You were like kind of yeah, like I was the guy you're... that would walk out there and, and kind of dial it in for the house guy somewhat. Okay. And then go back up on stage where I brought like certain microphones I liked. How did that tie you into to going on the road as solely an engineer? How did you transition from like, you know, um, being- that happened, I'd say late, like, <clears throat> like late eighties, like back then you could tour regionally. As I, I'd say there was a couple of bands that I did that were like, because word of mouth, I kind you know, and networking kind of by doing shows and clubs, you met other bands. Yeah. And they were kind of like, we're going to do this thing. And then there's a, then it kind of built up. And then I did house at this place called The Channel, which was a big 2000 seat club, 1700 seat club in uh, Boston. And that had a lot of people come through it. And I got to know more people through that. I always tell people when they start out, like, just get a band to do yeah. and get out there. Because then once you kind of do your thing, you can't help if people like it or not like it. But if you do something, you, you, you can't abstractly be like, oh, I can mix your band. It's like they really kind of have to hear what you do, even though what you do for one band might not be the same that you would be the same for another band. But yeah, but then this one band did a lot of regional touring. And through that, I I kind of started working at this one sound company in in, um, New England called Scorpio. They did some regional touring and and some national touring. They did like meatloaf and bands like that. And and it was great. It's like a great introduction into that side of things from going from the club thing to like the slightly bigger so, bigger thing and using better gear and so then you moved that. on to a production company right and then kind of they were kinda? just sound but it's yeah you know, like like as i did bands throughout throughout the place throughout boston and stuff i i always used them for any kind of rentals because they had all the yeah. pro gear and then through that started working for them and did like these wednesday nights at um, a place called Avalon. These other bands I did around the area were slightly older, but they would play like, you could play like 20 shows in Maine. You know, you could do two weeks in Maine. There was a, a circuit that you could do and just play, you know, six states and it kept people busy all year. Okay. But that was a good like mini touring experience. Like without that, I don't know if I could have went on the, the bigger tours and the longer tours. What would you consider the breakout artist that took you to the next step? Well, there was one band called, they're a Boston band called um, 
the Cave Dogs. They were like a power trio. They were signed to Capital. They had a sound guy who was a friend of mine. And he left to go do... He actually... I think he might have left to go do the Goo Goo Dolls, which is kind of funny, um, thinking back now. <laughs> but he, he went off to do something else. And then the drummer came to see a show I was doing and just loved it. Even though I was doing like more rock metal music than they were. They were definitely an alternative band. But they did a lot of big tours. And I they toured with Material Issue and drama rama and all those kind of bands so it was like the first let's go across the usa tour nice and that might have been 1990 ish something like that so then the, and ever since then it was just like touring right but and this is what at I the do. same time it's kind of like i did studio stuff too <laughs> yeah yeah so, so okay so i guess since we're talking about how you kind of transitioned uh, about what what time frame in retrospect to your touring did you start doing records like mixing records well in uh in 91 ish bands that i did like a lot of touring with or or shows with started getting involved with their recordings like once alternative kind of kicked in it was a little easier because in the 80s you know i did a lot of rock bands and metal bands and like you had to go to a real studio and and spend real money to do that so it's like i did a couple of those but not to the level of what i wanted to do because they still sounded demo-y yeah. you know because you're using an eight track and you're trying to recreate something that somebody else did on a 48 track couldn't get what i want out of it but live i could so that's why i gravitated to live more so than then that, but then in ninety one, ish. That's pro- that's about when bands started just sounding like what they sound like. Like if you have a band, yeah, you weren't trying to emulate anything. You were trying to just be yourself, yeah. Which was to me like a breakthrough because then you could do like an eight track and make something really interesting. And this one studio in uh, Boston, you know, a lot of bands that I did late eighties around Boston, kind of would always use this particular studio and their head engineer left to go to Florida. So I kind of jumped on that. Their owner was like, Hey, bring in any bands. You can do as much as you want for free till you get your chops going, you know, in this particular setting, they had a 24 track and it was, it was, it was great. And so we started doing all these different bands and, and one of them actually was um, my brother and I did this girl, Tracy Bonham, and we did an EP for, well, first we did two singles for her that became kind of big around town. And she could use that to spring off to get a record deal. And then we did an EP. And that was like my intro into like major labels. This was, you know, A&R guys and, you know, yeah. big but bigger budgets. And kind of went down that path and still did touring. And then, I don't know, I was doing like 50-50. But then around 97, there was a band I did a, a bunch of touring with called Letters to Cleo, which yeah. is where how I, I know Stacey Jones and half the Miley band. <laughs> it's all <laughs> yeah. from the, that Boston scene kind of so. But then in 97, we did this record called Go. I met a producer, Peter Collins, on that. And him and I kind of hit it off. And then I ended up working, like quitting the road, moving to Nashville and um, worked for him, doing all his records for like six years, seven years. That's what the most exciting part of of kicking this whole thing off was. Uh, bringing on someone that is doing something that I am fascinated with. <laughs> um, the 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 ability to connect both those worlds and broadcast. So it's like we're gonna get to that a little yep. bit later. <laughs> but um, I I gotta say, like one of the series of questions that I have for you, it was it's kind of like the the story of how we met was interesting because it leads to the next question, <laughs> which we were what we we were at Glastonbury and was it 2019? Yeah, yeah. And we were in catering, and I think I was making some some jokes or something. Where the, where the best meetings are, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we were and, both at catering late. I yeah, think that day, yeah. And we, you know, I was, I, and I, for some reason, I was like, and I was like, okay, well, what are you like? I'm Drew. What do you wh- like? I mix so and so. You and I was like, who do you who are you here with? And you're like Miley, and I was like, oh, okay, cool. We got to talking just in the line, and then just ended up sitting at a table and having lunch. Right. And one of my favorite questions is to ask you know, engineers, what's the best show you've ever heard? And I've heard a lot of people say Beck as a show. <laughs> and I mean, I've known that for the last couple of years. And I was like, oh, you know, I always had it in the back of my mind. And I, I was like, <laughs> it's all of a sudden it snaps that you were like, oh yeah, I also mix Beck. And I was like, that's amazing. I was like, right. I'm so glad we could sit down and talk. I think that that question 
I got to turn it around and ask you, what's the best show that you didn't mix? What, what's the best show you've seen uh, that you didn't mix? Other than anything Scoville's done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because even yeah. as a kid, even as, as a teenager, when Scoville took over mixing Rush, there was like this sonic difference that was like, all of a sudden, it sounded like a record. You know, the guy that mixed Rush before, you know, it always sounded great you know, yeah. and big and huge for three guys. But there was like this thing to detail, like this this precision to the mix that all of a sudden, you know, as, as a fan, I heard. It was the first time I think I've like made my way towards the front of house to like I actually talk to him for a second <laughs> at, at one of these shows. I had no idea. I was just like, how did you do that? <laughs> like, that's that kind of how it was because it was just this mind-blowing sonic landscape that didn't exist before. You know, it just was, it took it like one step further. Would you say Robert Scoville is, is a, a influential engineer in the way that Definitely. you kind like, of like, started? Like in my studio stuff, my influences were like Bob Clearmount and Tom Laralgi, some Jack Joseph Quigg, like, like all those mixers yeah. influenced me in some way or another. But on that side, I would say Scoville was the first one that made me go, oh, I could take it to here. Because I, at first I thought, okay, I was, you know, I was using lots of effects on vocals and drums like that's kind of what I was why people liked me in the beginning I think was like I was not afraid of effects you know late 80s it's like I'd slather on reverbs like ridiculously like I don't care if we're in a 300 seat club I want it to sound like a 16,000 seat arena yeah. stuff that just made it exciting you know and made you like want to listen to it for 90 minutes you know for live sound if something's just samey for 90 minutes it's like you're not going to keep people engaged I always want to make it exciting whether it's mixing a record, mixing live sound, or mixing broadcasts. You just have to pe keep people's attention, which yeah. through the years is harder and harder and harder <laughs> to do. Well, let's shift gears to the um, this big question. Obviously, pulling um, some comments for questions for a later part of this. But I was really happy to find out that everyone was really interested in the same thing that I was interested in, of the particular skill set that you have. Um, and for people that may not know, you've mixed some huge records, and then you've mixed some of those same people, those artists, on tour. And then those same artists for some of the biggest broadcasts that go out across yeah. the airwaves. What is the thing that ties them through? Like, Is there any particular way that you could explain that, that aha moment or that light bulb or that that thread that, that goes through all three of those things? Is there something that you can kind of... Well, it kind of comes explain? back to the excitement thing. So it's like yeah. each each of those mixes, you're, you're going for the same goal, you know? So, you're, so you're, your goalpost is, is kind of the same thing, but you might have to slightly get there a different way. Let's say a distorted vocal. Let's just use that as an example. Like in the studio, you can distort the hell out of it and there's no... <laughs> feedback you have isolation so it's like you can kind of go as far as you want with that yeah when you get to the live setting you have to kind of like go how do i make it achieve the same vibe without like without all that gain you know that obviously you can't do you know yeah. and and different ways to get around that in broadcast you can kind of get away with more but you still have leakage in that microphone yeah. you know so you have to deal with the leakage i'd say the leakage is the one thing that scares a lot of studio guys when they go do something live or broadcast, they're like, wait, what's all this stuff? I can't compress that as much as I normally do. They want to do this thing that's a lot easier to do in the studio and it's a lot harder to do live. So so excitement is one of the things that kind of is a, an underlying theme across these three. You know, it's easier when you have a you know, million watt piece. It's like, it's easier to create it with loudness, yeah. but then on records and and also in broadcast, you don't have that. So you have to get it another way, you know, you have yeah. to, you're getting out of a computer speaker or a TV speaker. You want it to feel and make someone excited the same way that standing in front of a you know, PA at 105 dB is exactly. going to make you feel. First off, like, I guess, well, let's introduce this section by um, figuring out what tour you were last on before the, right. <laughs> the, the pandemic happened. <laughs> What was the last tour that you were on and what rack are we looking at? That would be Beck. Yeah. Beck would be 2019. That went to pretty much till October. 
let's look at the rack. Let's let's okay. dig into this because this is <laughs> this is I'm very interested in the process of how you came to carry this this uh, plethora of goodies, right? <laughs> So what do we got going on here? Uh, can you first of all, can you walk us through the orientation of of the rack? Is there a reason why certain gear is in a certain place? First off, and is there yeah. a flow to the rack that you can explain to us? Yeah, there's definitely a flow. I mean, I had the rack before I I ended up taking it apart and built it this way. Like stuff I need to touch and mess with, I had in the first section. So basically, it's like the top is the master bus processor, which is obviously on the master bus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense. And now, you know, sometimes during the show, I might play with the limiting sometimes. Okay. But I'm, I always mess with that a little bit. The next four things are Beck's vocal. Okay. So you have the 5045, um, a little freaky cue, the BSS, and the distressor. And they and go pretty much in that order. Okay. So the signal are. flow is, is in that order. From yeah, so, so it's pretty much like get rid of the crap out of the mic. Yeah, EQ the mic. <laughs> yeah, and then have some dynamic EQ, and then the uh, the distressor, and then that I like to have next to me because depending on how he's singing that day or not, or or where we are in the set, I can push the input of the distressor. I can push the input to the little freak to kind of get more gain if I need to. Before we move on, yeah, can you explain to to people your your choice of of EQ? I think that that's an interesting mm-hmm. choice. I don't I I don't think I f- I feel like I've seen the little freak a whole lot in a lot of different racks. Is there a reason why you particularly chose that EQ for Beck? Two reasons. One was size because it was one rack space versus two. Because usually I would use a GML. Okay, that's why I use a Miley's touring rack is a GML EQ on our focal. And but this you know has two filters. You have a high pass, low pass. You have a bunch of parametric. Yeah, and so you can really notch something down if you need to. And then it also has a deesser on it. It's got quite a bit, and it has a saturation kind of thing. Oh, really? So if you hit it a certain way, it sat- it has a saturation circuit that you can pop in and out. Okay. Um. So it has a lot. It packs a punch for what it is. So it's not just an EQ. It's kind of Okay. Colors it a little bit, you know. I guess we kind of skipped over the console that you're carrying. So you're on an S6L for this yep. tour, or for this particular tour. Yeah. Is there any cho- the reason why you chose the S6L for, for this? Um, well, Sully, who mixed the band before me, who did a great job with them, yeah, um, was on a profile. And then look, when we were kind of switching over, we were both doing the band for a while. So we were, just kept the profile. And we just kept kind of kept one file that we both kind of, kind of beat on a little bit. <laughs> okay. So when we changed over to S6, in the beginning, it's like there was the possibility of me needing him to cover stuff or vice versa. So okay. it's kind of like, well, let's go down this path. You know, it's like I can, I can import in some of the snapshots, even though it's all rewritten by now, but it's I can yeah. at least start off with where I left off and then build from there. But I pretty much started from scratch for this by the time we got to this tour but i'm guessing that this is on the in- first insert on your vocal channel correct right so this is the uh and then pretty much there's nothing else other than a phoenix that's the plugin i use on him most of his his stuff is uh is all analog okay so then his channel strip is kind of flat for the most part with the exception yeah. of the 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 phoenix like i'll end. use this all to pretty much get what i need to and then if there's something if it's a weird room and anything weird going on, I'll use the digital EQ for that. The only other plugin I have is something that kicks in to make his voice radio out. Okay. Yeah. It's just a high pass, low pass thing. Got it. It's automated and okay. it's on a switch that I kind of on the, the SXL has, you know, you can use the buttons. So I can just hit the button and it, all of a sudden radio out a word or a sentence or whatever I want to do. Okay. I want to talk about the BS901, the BSS901, because that's something that I. As a younger engineer and not being able to carry analog gear and being lucky enough to carry a desk in the beginning, um, right. you, I didn't get my hands on this unit, so I don't know a whole lot. Uh, is it so? This is just a multi-band dynamic EQ. Uh, yes, it's a is, multi-band dynamic. Well, can you, you can either make it boost things at a certain threshold, or it's kind of like what the C4 was based on in a way, but it's way more. It's a little more intuitive than that, but it, you okay. can gate. You can actually gate certain frequency areas. So oh, really? some people used to use it kind of like a pre fifty forty five, where you could put a slight gate on the top end. So when someone doesn't have not singing into their microphone, the top's gated. 
Okay. And then when they sing, it opens up, but there's, it's still open enough that like, if they were away from the mic, you could still pick them up a little bit. Well, it's definitely an interesting piece. I've heard a, a couple of, of the uh, other front of house heavies uh, talk <laughs> about this unit. So it's, it's, I think we all used it the minute it came out. We were all like, <laughs> first Finally. we were like, what is it? What is it? It's like, yeah. and then everybody just started, oh, it can do that. And I don't have to do that. Like, I mean, my favorite thing about it at first when I used it was that I can, you know, the low mid. Yes. Which is the problem that like in most PAs and stuff, it's like, you don't want to pull it out because you still need it. Yeah. And it's like on, on a vocal, especially like a female vocal. It's like, if you pull too much 250, 300 out of the vocal, it can get thin when they go higher. Exactly. You know, but yeah, but you need it when they sing lower. Like with this, it's like when the female vocalist would go, I could leave all that stuff in, make it sound a lot fatter when they sing higher. And then when they sing lower, it would get rid of it, the stuff I don't need. You know, I always thought it good. I never used it as this, but I've used the C4 this way, like on a snare drum, where when they hit the snare drum, it boosts 5K. Okay. You get the whack. Yeah. But then it goes away. So you don't get the bleed of the cymbal, the hi hat go. Yeah, you know, in there. Yeah, and probably a lot of the things that you had f- found yourself like bouncing. Like there's, there's always a few inputs that you just tweak the whole entire show, and a dynamic right. EQ is so great for helping minimize the amount of channels that you have to change. Right. You know, as it goes. Okay, so now we we've got we've talked his vocal chain, and now we have a, a secondary uh, sets of of the. Is it? The, so that's everybody's uh, background vocals. Oh, okay. Okay, so one would assume the stereo distressors, right? For uh, yeah. background vocals, I'm no. guessing. <laughs> kick and snare. Oh no, kick and snare. Okay, <laughs> okay. I was tr- I was trying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have kick and snare now. We're getting into drums. Yep. yep. All right. Uh, any particular like? Is that the only analog piece you have k- for kick and snare? Yeah, because I was using um the SSL plug-in for the thing. Usually I would, I have these SSL channel strips I used to love to take on for kick and snare, but okay, the plug-in sounds pretty close. Can we talk a little bit about your settings for the distressors? Are you doing any uh, uh, THD control? Some, some, uh, no, most of it's all, I mean, all my distressor settings are usually two to one. So it's a low ratio. Okay. And then it's fast, like drums is fast attack, fast release. You know, I'll play with the attack just so I let a little bit of the transient in. Yeah. But shape it that way. And then vocal is always fast attack, slow release, pretty much. I'll play with the attack to make sure playing with the S's a little bit. And then the release just kind of is around six or seven. So that way it's it grabs it, but then it's not like yanking it. Yeah. You know? Okay. And it's just kind of, you're, and you're not hitting it hard then. Are you? No, I mean, I do low ratios. I might compress a lot, but it's always oh, low, okay. low ratios. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. All right. So then, what what is this yellow thing you've got here? It's something that I've well, never the Emperor, seen anyone else's. Which, yeah. Which my original drum bus was the um, the overstayer that's underneath it and the API. God. And I kind of wanted something um, because the API doesn't have a mix knob. I just wanted to get something with a mix knob. And this is before the API with the mix knob came out. So I I started playing around some stuff and I tried this overstayer thing. It has a drive into it. Like the overstayer can do a pretty good job of crunching up the drums. Yeah. I was trying to combine the two things below it into one unit, which didn't work as well. It actually worked better with all three units together. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> of course, it was like, I was trying to like <laughs> combine everything into one unit and it has a dry and a wet. But the Emperor is like a limiter. So it's, when I added that to the mix of the drums, it just did something that, m- that made them sound fatter and bigger. And it took the transients off in a nice way. But not bad. And like I'm not whacking any of that stuff, but it's like now it's it's funny because I was gonna get rid of the API, then I punched it in one day and I was like, oh, it sounds good with all three, not <laughs> not all doing heavy lifting, you know. Yeah. So drum wise, we're we're looking at um, is this the the first of all, I guess, how do you break out your drums? Do you have like uh, uh, just a drum bus for Beck, or do you do like a squashed bus, or do you do like a kick and snare bus? Uh, like, how do you break up your drums and how does that work into well, I used to do three pieces? wet drums, dry drums for a long time and just kind of did a blend of those. When I started doing Beck, it, it, kind of coming from Sully again, he kind of thought of like, just do one bus and then kind of mix the stuff in, you know? Yeah. And I was like, you know what, let me try that. And 
I kind of like the single bus simplicity yeah. of it and then using the mix knob more, you know, and blending it in. And he had all plugins on, on his originally. And then I started replacing it with analog stuff. Okay. And of course, it was like, oh, that sounds even cooler. <laughs> yeah. The first thing I replaced when I took over was I put that mass unit in. And that thing on the drums just was like magic. It's actually magic on everything. <laughs> I, I heard some demos and it sounds phenomenal. I mean, I have four of them here. So it's like, <laughs> so it's kind of like a tape saturation unit, right? Is that, is that kind what of, but not kind of like a tape? It's like its own thing, but it has, has switches to kind of shape the sound. Like there's a low yeah. end boost and a high end boost and, and it has a mix knob. So you can like do something radical and then just blend it in a little bit. Okay. And so just the first day I put it across the drums and I was like, Okay, that's magic. It just all of a sudden made the drums sound like way more not aggressive, but like present and in your face and like cooler sounding, you know? Yeah, yeah. And this with is back, so all the drums go through different eras of time too. Okay. So it's like you have the yeah. newer record, which is more modern sounding. The older stuff is more vintagey sounding, and then we have yeah. acoustic stuff. So it's like need something there to keep it all tied together. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you have one drum bus. And then you use the imper first just to take a little bit off, right? Yeah. Is that, and then you hit it with some vibe. Yeah. And, and then you use the the twenty five hundred as the final kind of like the like compression. A finisher almost. The finisher. Yeah. And is there any EQ on the return of the drums? Do you ever do that, or no. do you usually just leave that to the channels? Just do it on the channels. Got it. And like, what about your uh, effects returns for your drums? Do you? Those do you all go in that same. Into that same bus? Bus. So that bus is yeah. like, because we try to make it so that sneaking into the broadcast thing, yeah. I can I can give the truck stems if I want to. And they're each thing. And this is this is a thing I picked up from Sully too, that um, is to make each guy a subgroup, you know, as you see the people. So it's like, it was cool. It's a cool way of thinking that I didn't think of it at, at, at first was like every subgroup is like, it's the keyboards, but if, if the keyboard player plays guitar, it would be in that subgroup also. So it's mm. like you're processing, you know, I'm not heavy handed with the processing for it. So it's not specific to that thing, but it's like that way it's like, here's all Rogers stuff, you know, mm. here's all so-and-so stuff. So when I send it out to the truck, if they put them all at zero, they're pretty much in the ballpark, mm -hmm. you know, but it's like, here's all the drums with the reverbs, everything. It's, it's just kind of like its own thing. I remember we were talking about left-right processing, and I think I asked a question. And you were like, no, I usually do most of my processing. I try to bake it into the groups right. for broadcast. Because you're thinking you're thinking in the next step, like the festival that you go to that you're going to need. You're like, I want to be able to just send out my mix or I want to be able to send out my groups all to Unity, just like you were saying. Right. But you want to bake that processing into those groups so exactly. that way you don't have tons of stuff on your left, right, that you're going to be missing, which that's one of the things that I'm like, okay, that that's pretty. And the same with background vocals, like background vocals have the, yeah. everything's baked into it. Yeah. Um, lead vocal is the only one that has two separate groups. So you have the separate effects. Mm -hmm. So that way in the truck, you can balance, you, you can put them the same or you can make them heavier or less, whatever yeah. you want to do. But the rest of it always has all the effects baked into it. So if there's like keyboards have reverb, they go on the keyboard thing. So when, and also when you mute those groups, you don't have that. Like if you mute the drum group and you had the reverbs going to left, right, you'd still hear yeah. those in your mix. Yeah, so. exactly. Well, and it's also kind of almost a studio trick too. Because I mean, if you build yeah. that into your studio file, so that way when you print stems for people, because tracks are a part of Well, that was life. the thing that was kind of an aha moment about it of like, I've been doing it for you know decades in the studio. <laughs> yeah. That way... Plus, like on drums, there's something about how the drum reverb and the drum going into the compression and all that ballistics being the same. So when you yeah. hit the drum, if you're using a decent amount of compression, it, you can hear the whack of the drum first. Yeah. And then the reverb kind of makes its way onto the end. So it kind of makes it into one thing. Yeah. And I've been doing that forever. So like when it was like, well, just go with one group. So um, clean. <laughs> yeah. It just made it easier. It was like, oh, I don't have to deal with phasing. I don't have to deal with all this other stuff. You know, it's... Yeah. It's. It took a while to find the ratios of that group versus everything else to get the way it was before, which is like if the drums and the vocals are up 6 dB-ish, 5 dB-ish, 
versus the rest of the instruments, if you do your groups that way, everything just kind of falls into place. Like if you put them all even, I feel like you're going to push your drums harder going yeah. into the bus. So, so you're saying you're you're if you were to leave your drums and vocals at unity and all your other groups down six dB, is that yeah? Okay, that kind of sits. Then like the whole thing kind of sits in the right ballpark. Oh, okay. That's that's pretty. And I do that on my summing mixer too because it has oh. a six button. Which okay. Well, I'm curious too. What about your like the the things that that really pop out to me is is sometimes there's a difference in and your your attack uh, settings, not yours particularly, but that the attack setting for the compressor is such a valuable tool to be used correctly for the oh, way yeah. that audio goes down the chain. So can you? kind of walk through a little bit of your approach with the 2500 over your drums? It's a little slower than the other stuff, I'd say. Yeah. Like, because you already have the distressors doing the fast attack thing. Yeah. You don't need to do it again. Exactly. And, um, and the limiter kind of is like a little safety for it all anyway. Oh, okay. But it's more vibey. So it's like, you know, I do the slower like 10 millisecond or whatever. Okay. Kind of like what you would put over your master bus dish type of thing. Let's let's jump down to the next little guy below that. Yeah, so I, so the UA is a 16x. This is kind of pre live rack when I started using this setup. Oh, okay, like the live rack just came, it kind of came out, but it was still under a Soundcraft. So but I and, use it mostly for reverbs and stuff. You know, oh, okay, yeah, and I ba mean bass amp. <laughs> so so reverbs, bass amp, anything <clears throat> else that you use the the UAD platform for? Uh, I mean, particularly to, for back, I guess. It is for Beck. I use yeah. I just use reverbs and plates, and then um, like the AMS. I use the plate, the EMT plate, and then I use the SVT bass amp for stuff, and then some delays. Okay. Like colory, kind like vibey kind of stuff that I would normally do analog. So, which plate do you use in the the UAD? Do you do the two 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 fifty or the one? Oh, the one forty. Yeah, I love the one forty. Yeah, and I I double that with a. Um, I think I have capital chambers now. I did have the 8kg spring. Okay. So they both came off the same send, but one was like, if you blend the two together, you can really like add the 8kg in for vibe. Yeah. And that's like this cool, cool verb. Yeah. Is that is that what you were using for vocal reverb? Yeah. Okay, cool. And then the AMSs were on drums. I was an AMS and a 4DL on drums once that came out. Okay. That's the other reason why I like the 16X over the live rack in this situation is that I could use the newest plugins. Yeah. yeah. So if the, when the 480 came out, I could use that immediately, you know, <laughs> yeah. whereas in the live rack, they haven't ported it to that yet. So. Oh, okay. All right. Well, let's jump to the other side of your rack, which is, uh, which Mostly I can't effects. see. <laughs> yeah. I can't see what's on the very top. It's a Demeter spring reverb. Oh, okay. What's, what's the, what's the deal with that guy? It's uh, I wanted to get something like super vibey for the acoustic set of our thing. Oh, Even okay. though the plugins were kind of vibey, I was like, I don't know. I feel like something real would be cool here. And so I bought this from Demeter, and they made it extra, extra heavy duty for um, touring because I was like, this is going to go on tour. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be sending it back every other day. And it has two two spring sets in it, and you can make them either be stereo or mono. You can make it. Stereo in, stereo out, mono in, stereo out. So each there's a spring on each side. Okay. Well, let's get into the H3000. Well, yep. we got we got a couple of them. We have a long verb and a double. It looks like. Yeah. So um, the long verb is kind of a a modulated reverb on there, or they call it swept verb, but I changed the settings a bunch. This is a direct steal from not even a steal because he showed me how to do it. But from Tom Lord Algae. This was like one of my just favorite. It's just an eighties ish sounding verb because it modulates at the tail. Okay. And it just has like this Doppler y effect to it. Um, so I use that for instruments and for some stuff. I'll send delays into it. Okay. So when the delay hits it, it kind of bends it a little bit. Oh, okay. It's very cool. I mean, I've been using that setting 25 years. Well, what's the <laughs> setting called again? Uh, Is there swept, a swept reverb, but you have to play with the yeah. settings on it. When you first okay. bring it up, it's not as, as amazing, but you can make it really long. It's actually a multiple delay program. Oh, so okay. it's it's all tap delays creating a reverb. Okay. So each one has different modulations to it, and but it just does this cool like you just put stuff in it. And you're like, oh, I know that sound. All right. Well, the infamous double. I mean, yep. this is this is uh this is something that I think a lot of people may know the sound from the records, 
right? This is such a yeah. H3000 I mean, thing. And I mean, I, I personally have never, I've used an H3000 once, maybe, like right. once or twice. Um, so this is another one of those interest, interesting pieces that I feel like, and I, I mean, listening to even Miley's, you know, your your shows that you just recently did in, in the pandemic, just, just your board mix. I know that this has to be a pretty important part of, of your vocal sound for her and probably a tool you use for most of your acts, right? Yeah, I've been using that since the day it came out. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> And it's just, I use the first setting, which is just, a, it's it's a little bit up, a little bit down with some delay. It doesn't modulate this one. Like there's another setting I have that will modulate the left and right on, on the sides. But I feel like for vocals, I didn't like it as much because it sounds, it can make things sound pitchy. This just gives you a little range. In the 90s, it was always like, oh no, I don't want reverb on my voice. Oh, I don't want delay on my voice. Yeah. I want my voice dry. Yeah. You know, like, and it's like, yeah, but you don't really want your voice dry. You know, it's like, yeah, it's like nothing exciting. I mean, no matter how pointy. exciting a singer is, it's like you want a little bit of something, something there. So this was like the thing that like you can add in in certain amounts. Obviously, like, you know, Ozzy Osbourne or, or Smashing Pumpkins, there's tons of it, you know, tons of it. Yes. 311, I think. But that doubler is just like it just you just add it in even subtly. And it's like it does something. It's that thing that like you don't know it's there until you shut it off. Yeah. Effect. Plug-in wise, they've gotten close. There's something about the analog in and out of it that makes it sit right and sit Got better it. than than like a plug-in. Because the plug-in, I always can hear the plug-in no matter how loud or soft I put it. Mm -hmm. With this, I can add it in there and it just does something and it doesn't, it just sounds like a record, but without, but still sounds dry. Well, and I mean, that's such an important part too, I think that, especially for the live world, because I feel like being able to not make such a, a pokey center channel with just the dry vocals in in a live you know setting. Having that vocal a little bit more tucked, but spread a little bit wider. Right. You know, like how wide do you go with this? Do you do left left right, or do you like do a fifty fifty, or or you're trying to do left right with it live? Oh yeah, just add it in in the studio. I pull it in a little bit. Yeah, but I just try to keep it out there, but I don't make it too loud. You just sense it. You don't hear it per se it just does something and then i mean you could bring it up and make it like on back some of his stuff needs to sound heavy doubling yeah because on the records it's done that way and i'll use it for that too but um so what do we got going <laughs> on below that i is that, that is that your in and out in and out for your spring reverb or is that no no that's for uh delay pedal that's oh, at delay. the console oh, so that okay. that just sends those yellow those orange things send to and from um pedals so they match it so that you can get in and out at plus four okay and it has a mix knob and all kinds of stuff it's kind of cool but oh okay but that's mainly used so i i'm sending and returning to a foot pedal that's on that's sitting on my console that i basically will do throw delays to and bend things down and okay just just a kind of cool vibey delay what what's the the pedal that you were using it was a uh Death by was it Death by Audio? One of those to like cool boutique company delay pedals. Uh, okay, all right. I'll have to I'll have to check it out. So just like a tape delay or just like a like it's a, a, it's like a bucket. A bucket it's like an analog reggae? delay pedal. Got it. But you can like take the feedback and yank. Like I'll just sometimes grab stuff and just mess with it. All and right, then the so next thing is um is Jason's guitars. Jason oh, okay. has a AC thirty and a Supro and needs something tubey and compressor just to really make it spank. Okay, so is the the TK that's a TK audio piece? Yeah, that I was using on other guitars here and there. Um, okay, it was kind of like one of those new things I just threw in there and was like, oh, that kind of works. And it's kind of there as a backup. So like, if anything, like if the API should die, mm. I can kind of just use it for that. Like, it's not as cool sounding, but it's okay. It's a cool little piece, though. I I didn't realize it has like a a total harmonic distortion switch. Oh yeah, just drop it in. Well, I originally bought that instead of the the Emperor. Yeah, I was like, let me try that thing, and it it's cool too because it has a mix knob. But I wanted to try it on like across Beck's guitar bus, and it worked pretty well. Just, but it's, it's pretty clean, even okay. using the harmonic thing. But it's oh really? And, and you then, said, and then the DCL two hundred is that across the the guitar that, bus? I guess no, that's actually on his two actual mics. Oh, okay. So okay, which one mic is now a uh, a direct. Because we started, switch, we switched the Palmers on a lot of stuff. Okay. Because um, Beck wanted to get the stage volume down. 
There's yeah. only like one guitar mic on the whole stage. Everything else is 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 uh, Palmer's and old Riviera um, speaker emulators. The only thing that's mic'd is his Supra, his um, Silvertone, because the speaker is part of the sound on that amp. But everything else, it was the amp, you know, making the sound. So, so you have this big gigantic rack of analog awesomeness. Yep. And recently, you were telling me that you with Miley. And with these particular shows, you've been doing something different. You were switching to a, a 64 channel UAD live rack uh, rig. Can you walk us through what your mindset is? Are you just you're just trying to go lighter? Uh, well, originally, you, it was doing the um, the 2019 shows that, that I met you on. We had to do a lot of flying around, and it was like for most of the gigs, Britt Rowe was doing. I could have a rack and it would be there. The first time I saw it was at the big gig mm. in uh, yeah. in London. So it's like, I have this rig, but I'm writing down my settings. You know, I could recreate the rig and then go there, but we weren't, you know, sound. we were going to have a sound check, but it wasn't much time. Yeah. So I was like, if I go the UAD route, I could just show up, plug it in, and there it is. I mean, I can have a distressor for her vocal and a uh, H3000, and those take two seconds to set up. You know, doing everything else would be like just recreating something and it would change every day. So yeah. I was like, let me go down that this route with the UAD. It worked so well. You know, no matter where we went, I just popped it in, loaded my file, and away we go. And you kind of described <laughs> to me that you were you're trying to put your entire show into this system. So that way, in essence, you would be able to switch desks, right? Uh, in theory, right. you would be able to switch whatever desks and that's your show. Right. And it's all snapshotted. And, oh, okay. And as much as I love the, the all the analog gear and yeah. how great that stuff sounds, this sounds pretty darn close and yeah. I can snapshot it all. So yeah. I can have a different rack for every song, basically, if I want. I mean, the consistency too, like this amount of analog gear, it would require a pretty fine tooth comb to go through to make sure everything, all the settings are doing what they're supposed to be doing because analog can be different even if it's the same piece of gear. It has to be kind of nice to have it all in the box and you know it's going to be exactly right. what you did, right? Right. And it's like, just turn it on and go. You know, and it follows snapshots and it's, you know, pretty much I had every, every input has a UA with a channel strip kind of setup. So it's like all my sounds are in the box. Yeah. And if I plug it into the console and just engage those inserts, the sounds are 90% there. And then if I need to tweak it a little bit, I can use the channel EQ for that. Well, we used it for, for that. And then um, we started rehearsing and I was there a couple of days later. I just started dropping these in and all of a sudden I had, I had a mix by the time they were done playing the first song at rehearsal. So to switch gears then, since this is the Miley rig now that, the, yep. that we're talking about, um, are you, so you're, you're processing a select amount of inputs directly on the channel and then a select amount of groups, probably including your left, right. So that's kind yep. of how you have that. IO like. and then all the reverbs and delays and everything. Okay, yeah, yeah. And and those as well. Yeah, it's like pretty slick. That's like your whole yeah. con that's your console. Technically. Right. It's all in there. I'm it's just using the there. console as a summing mixer. <clears throat> well, yeah. it looks like you still have like one H three thousand down there. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> but then like the last, you know, get now we get into the remote thing. I came back from Christmas from my parents and I had to quarantine for 10 days. I couldn't be at rehearsal for the first week. Mm -hmm. And so I I was like, let's Let's figure a way to like, so I can just be at home. Mm -hmm. And at least the idea was just to kind of make snapshots, get the song names in, follow along, record. It worked so well that I ended up never going to rehearsal. I did it all <laughs> from home. I was remoting into the console with one computer. Then I remoted into Pro Tools with another computer just to control that. Yeah. I mean, the audio stayed local there except for my left right bus well solo bus basically i sent to myself over unity connect and could listen to my whole solo bus in full fidelity um had talkbacks back and forth and then i had another computer that controlled the ua and i was able to like make make my mixes everybody there had a, a left right out of mind going into a set of in-ears so when management would show up at rehearsal they just there was 20 headphones with packs <laughs> they just grab a pack throw a headphone on all sanitized <laughs> of course and uh they could listen to my mix and it made everybody happy. I mean, just so everyone's clear, you were doing rehearsals remotely from your house. Right. Four uh, miles away from four rehearsal. miles away from the site. 
Right, with 11 you, milliseconds you, round trip. <laughs> 11 millisecond delay round trip, three laptops, right? You had one computer yep. controlling the console, one controlling Pro Tools, and one controlling the UAD. And then rack. a fourth one for Unity Connect. It was and the four, four by four audio four by going four. back and forth. Okay. You worry me. Don't make this too good because <laughs> then we'll never, we'll never go back. Do you think that this is going to be kind of how you will progress with Beck? I think so. Like this is like the best way to do the first few weeks of rehearsal. Yeah. Hey, you're not hearing all the noise in the room. You're actually hearing what your console is giving you. Yeah. You're not being inf- infected by any of that. I can hear exactly what's coming out of the console, which going back to broadcast, you know, if the console's spitting out exactly what you want, then that's then you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. That's just tune the PA correctly. Yeah. How different is your Miley Cyrus vocal chain on the analog world versus the digital world? What are, what are the things that, are you able to do it all in the box uh, and feel satisfied with it? Or is there still, I mean, a, apart from the obvious <laughs> H3000, um, is there anything else analog in her, her chain that you you know have to add in? Because usually I have the, the UA as a copy of it in case the analog stuff broke. Yeah. But... Since when I was doing the remote thing, I was like, since I can't change the analog stuff, I'm going to just play with this for now. And she wasn't coming in for a couple of weeks. I A-beat it versus the the digital. And it's like the digital sounded better, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> like it might have been just the H, whatever H3000, I, I mean, not H3000, the stressor I got. Yeah. Might have just sounded not as good or, or yeah. something. But it's like, it, it was, <laughs> at best, it was even. Yeah. And I was like, well, I might as well just leave it in the box and save the conversion. And yeah. You well, know. I mean, it makes it a little easier. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's pretty fascinating. So basically for that particular situation, the only thing that you were going to do was an analog distressor, but you ended up opting to stay in the box. Right. Well, I don't want to stretch on the BSS, but... And the BSS. Oh, But okay. the Sony Oxford Dynamic EQ is just, it's, it's just as good. It yeah. kind of does similar things and it has more filters if you want. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's pretty. That's a pretty cool little idea. We'll have to get to the big question then. Uh, if I were to ask you what your secret sauce was, what's your secret sauce? Where well, you're going to spill the beans? What, what's your What's your secret sauce? I don't know. The distressor always seems to be the, <laughs> the distressor. The winner. I, I mean, mean, I use that. The yeah. thing is, I use it on broadcast so much for vocals that it always, always works. Yeah, like on vocals and broadcast, it just makes no matter who the singer is. It just makes it sit there, right there on your TV. Now it's almost superstition. Like <laughs> I go to SNL, it's like they put two distressors in because they were sick of renting them every time I showed up. <laughs> I'm serious. They 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 were they either found them or they bought them. I don't know what they did, but they were just like, those are for you. Okay. So so tell us what your what your if you if the distressor is your secret sauce, how do you set up the distressor? What's your for vocals? What's your your go to? Kind of your starting page. If say you were going to start with a vocalist you've never worked with, where where would you start that guy up? Like I said, on all of them, it's always low ratio, so it's a two to one. So that way, even if you cream it, it's not really creaming the vocal. Yeah. Um, and then I always set the attack at zero, release at six, and then the input and output you have to play with, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Um, and then I'll just slowly crack open the attack until things get essy. And I'll just kind of notch it back a tiny bit and just kind of play with it that way. Is there an amount of reduction that you're looking to achieve or are you just kind of trying to not take Not really. I the- just try to like, like find, like make it sure it's not like destroying itself on loud parts, but they're always kind of in it a little bit. The worst place to be is being in that, that line where it's like you're out in, out in, out in, out in kind of. Yeah. But okay. like on some stuff, like um, when Miley did SNL 40th, and I did that with Josiah. <laughs> Uh, Bob Clearman was there and yeah, Miley starts off the song really quiet and really low. Yeah. And she's like lighting up, you know, the first, <laughs> the one LED and that's it. Yeah. We get to the end of the song and she's ripping to shreds and I look over and it's like in 20. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, but it sounds great. It's like, it's right there. It's not like, it doesn't have that TV yeah. weird thing. Clearman is like, the look on his face was like, I just killed his kids. <laughs> I'm dead serious. He had this like, and I looked at him. I said, sounds good, doesn't it? And he didn't know what to say. He was like, he was just, I go, and I just, I used like his theory, like things he would say back on him. I said, 
Use your ears, not your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. Right. Well, I mean, I love that. Do you use, uh, for the detector, do you have like the mid-range detector on? Do you have uh, any like harmonic? Normally I leave all that thing? off. That stuff I just leave off. And then like, if I need to, I'll kick into it. Well, I, I love that you were able to share that with us. I think that <laughs> um, that was one of the things that I really wanted to get out of this, this uh, show was um, I kind of feel like from my experience, I could tell someone exactly what I do. And even if I even give them a file, they can still mess it up. Right. Um, and I love that with all of your expertise and experience, you have no problem telling us <laughs> what, what you do and what you think your secret sauce is, how, what you feel like. This is going to be the quick fire question, questionnaire right. section where we put it up on the socials a couple of days before, uh, Paul, you were tagged in it. Uh, we wanted to get some questions that were interested from everybody. And I just chose a couple random uh, questions just to see if we, you know, we'll, we'll try to rattle, rattle through them somewhat quickly. The first question I have for you, Desert Island, Mike, plug-in, outboard gear. I think we already answered it, but go ahead and uh, share your answers. Problem is, I'm one of those guys that wants to take. I'm like the the jerk was at the end of the movie. I'll just want this thing. Okay, if you could thing. do, say, say, mm -hmm. is there a mic out there that you think you could do an entire show with, like, like a rock band? Like, say you right. were doing a rock band. It was like guitar, bass, drums, vocals. What mic do you think you'd get away with doing everything with if you I mean, only had one mic? As an older mic, I'd say a 421. Okay. As a newer mic, maybe the Heil. PR30, PR40. Be interested, like taking the mic you're using, the high, the SE V7. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm curious what that would sound like in a kick drum. Cause I kinda, good, I kinda. good vocal mics sound good in kick drums. Those uh, Unidyne 4s that I have from the 70s. Yeah. Those you could definitely use. If I had 20 of those that were all in perfect condition, that would probably be my Desert Island mic. <laughs> so then, what about plug in? If you could only have one plug in, BX SSL. E channel plug in outboard gear. This is going to be a tough one, but I think I might know what the answer is. <laughs> Probably a distressor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. My second question would be desks you've never worked on but would like to try. Like the consoles. SSL, I'd say. The SSL. I mean, I test, I did a shootout with it, and the EQ on it's insane sounding. Yeah. And I've grown up on SSL desks. What's that's, preventing that's, you from taking the leap? Just having time sitting programming it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thoughts? on the stigma placed on studio engineers interested in getting into the live show mixing realm. This is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that is a quick, quick fire question, but we'll give it a shot. I mean, the two different things, like it depends if you're a studio guy that started out, like you just, if you, if you like, just get your sound to the end of the console and that's it, then you're going to get eaten alive in a live setting. Yeah. If you're the guy that like, you know, when we used to print to analog, got into tweaking the machine and making sure that got captured the way he wanted and, and cared about where it went after it left the console, then you might have half a chance because in the studio, you know, you go from mic to console to tape. Whereas with um, live, it's like you got the PA system and then the thing called feedback. <laughs> <laughs> Since I went from live to studio, back to live, back to studio, and you know, dance back and forth, it's like I kind of I was always interested in where the sound went all the way up to the speaker. You know, I, I wanted to be in control of it. Might have been a control freak thing, but I wanted to be in control of it after it got on the mic until it left the speaker. In recording, what it did through mastering and came out on the CD, like I just always had this thing of following the process all the way through. So I think for me personally, live, it's like since I'm interested in the speaker systems and crossover and the amps and all that stuff and knowing that any change in that makes a difference and can affect your sound, it's not just a flat thing. And then, of course, the room and all that stuff. I always worked my way backwards because it was always like, make the PA sound the way you want. And then when you go to mix, the mix will be a lot easier to do. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of studio guys would tweak the hell out of their mix and then go out and, and turn it on in front of a PA, you know, on a PA system and get into all kinds of trouble. The next question I have for you is favorite front of house headphones. My great friends at Audix <laughs> sent nice. me these. Okay. These could be the new standard. They're not, not expensive. I mean, they're a few hundred bucks. Yeah. They're very comfortable. Are they flat or are they hyped? They're flat. I think there's a little bit of hyping going on, but like enough to make them comfortable. Yeah. But it's okay. they've translated. 
like when I was finishing up my my mix for the Super Bowl thing, I put those on, tweaked a couple of little things. When I opened up my file on on the K1 system, it translated like unbelievably. <laughs> Is there a product number on them? Oh, it's the A150, I think. It's like A150s. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So I had another question that's pretty interesting. Has he ever had a song written about him and what were the lyrics? <laughs> what is that all about? That's the Goo Goo Dolls crew band, Angry Neighbors. <laughs> yeah, what's the name of the song? Well, that's let me give you a little obvious, background on them. They write they yeah. write songs on everything touring. <laughs> so they have like, yeah. like one song is called Creepy Truck Driver, yeah. which we all have seen that. And then one's about lighting. Which, yeah, but I can't really say the name because it's it's not PG. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then the song they wrote about me is called Hagermeister, which has a pink noise solo in it. Of course, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> Another question for you: What is the one thing on your mind at the start of a show? That's a good question. Um, that time between playing the intro and the lead vocal coming in, it's like. Okay, just as long as I hear that lead vocal, yeah, that's the aha moment, you know. And you're like, okay, I hope she has the right mic. Like, you know, there's just all these yeah. thoughts are firing through your head until you hear that first that first vocal coming yeah. through the PA, and it sounds good. Same with Beck, even though he uses wired mics, it's just like once you hear that first vocal, nice and loud, <clears throat> the rest is easy. Paul, I can't thank you enough for doing this and taking a chance. No problem. Glad I did. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be fun. I'm I'm so glad that you were able to come on and tell us. I mean, I feel like there's so much information to unpack here. I hope everyone enjoys it. Can't thank you enough. Um, thanks, no problem. Paul. Glad to do it. I'll we'll have right. to do another one sooner. Definitely. We'll, <laughs> we'll talk soon. Well, that's it for this episode of Over Your Shoulder. I want to thank Paul for coming on and sharing his knowledge. If you dug this, please like, please share. And please subscribe. Until next time, take care and be safe. Bye.